Okay, so we're going to try this again. Let's see if we've got audio on the feed. Awesome. Okay, so good evening, everyone. I'm Shelly Keith, your guest host for this evening's semi-special Wednesday edition of Higher Ed Live, the weekly web show for marketing and web professionals. You can usually tune in to Higher Ed Live on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern on higheredlive.com and join the conversation on Twitter using the Higher Ed Live hashtag. You can follow me on Twitter at Shelly Keith. Up until recently, I was the manager of web communications and online marketing at Southern Arkansas University. And now I'm the Director of Digital Communications at the University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, Virginia. The new job required a cross-country move, brought me into a much larger team with more resources and a very different way of doing things, and landed me in an institution with some really amazing opportunities for great web projects. Needless to say, my life these days is one giant learning moment after another. So that's why I'm here. Tonight's show is all about settling in and doing the work after you've made a job transition. We'll talk about challenges, cultures, and trade-offs that make up the reality of life after you nail the interview. Uh, but before I introduce tonight's panel, I'd like to take a few, give a few shout-outs to um, our sponsors. Uh, Omni Update is the leading web content management system CMS provider for higher education. The company's web CMS OU campus is secure and scalable with great tools and features, deployment flexibility, and an awesome user community. Looking for web CMS? Experience Omni Update's award-winning OU campus through a live demo. We're tweeting a link now. A higher Ed Live is sponsored by Integral, the creators of the school app. A private Facebook community to boost enrollment and retention. Check out their blog, Integral Insights, for posts on admissions marketing, student engagement, and social media in higher education. We're tweeting a link to that blog now. So let me introduce our guests. With us tonight are Georgie Cohen, Director of Online Content at Suffolk <laughs> University. <laughs> and, my, and my cat, apparently. And your cat. Uh, Matt Hertzberger, Senior Director of Web Strategy at Creighton University, and Drew Stevens, Webmaster at the Sam Walton College of Business mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. University of Arkansas. Um, so, Georgie, we're going to start with you. Tell us about your background and where you are now. Uh, yeah, so right now, again, I'm at Suffolk University, Director of Online Content, which is funny because it's actually where my mom went to school. She got her bachelor's there when uh, I was a little baby. Uh, just about my daughter's age, or a little older. Um, and in high school, I'd wear a Suffolk t-shirt around. People would be like, Suffolk? What's that? And I'm like, oh, you just don't get it. Um, and I started working there in uh, this past October. And prior to Suffolk, um, I spent a year on what I call my Vision Quest year. Um, I spent a year consulting uh, as Crosstown Digital Communications. I worked with a whole wide array of higher ed clients on projects ranging from news content strategy development, social media strategy, copywriting, uh, and I've been doing training, in-house training, and uh, various speaking gigs and, and some other random stuff. So uh, that was really interesting experience, exposing to a whole array of different kinds of universities, very large state schools, small liberal arts colleges, um, the whole the whole mix. Uh, prior to that, I'd spent almost seven years at Tufts University, just down the street from my house right here. Um, and when I left, I was the manager of web content strategy. Uh, I got my start in online journalism. I worked in the newsroom, the online newsroom of the Boston Globe for three years out of school, um, working on the breaking news desk and helping adapt Globe content for the web. And Georgie's also the co-founder of Meet Content. I'm throwing that in there even though she didn't include it <clears> in her bio because I read that blog extensively and I suggest everyone else does too. Right. Uh, so Matt, tell us about yourself. Um, yeah, so I'm Matt Herzberger. Uh, my new job, I'm the Senior Director of Web Strategy at uh, Creighton University. Um, before that, I was at Florida International University for four years. I was the uh, Director of Web Communications. Um, before that, I had stints at a couple other places. Um, I was at Texas A&M University for four years, University of Iowa. Um, I spent a number of years working for a, a digital web agency um, back in the day, uh, and now I've been in higher ed for about 10 years trying to, uh, you know, improve my talent, so I'm excited. All right, and Drew? I am Drew Stevens. I've been working in higher ed for about six and a half or seven years now, I guess, all limited to the state of Arkansas, the glorious state of Arkansas. Um, first as a web designer at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, U-A-L-R. Um, I was there for six years working as a web designer for the campus under communications. 
advancement. Um, in that capacity, I was kind of a overall web designer for the campus and all of the, uh, the headache that that entailed. And six months ago, I picked up and moved to the, quote, flagship uh, university here in the same state, moved about four hours north, packed up the wife and the kids and the dogs and, and made that move. And now I am a webmaster for the University of Arkansas, uh, Sam Walton College of Business. And so uh, it's been a good, good move for me. And uh, I like working in higher ed. That's why I'm here. Awesome. I'm just going to say go Trojans because I'm a grad student at UALR. So right, a right. shout out right there. Since you're not a fan, I will be. <laughs> uh, we, we have a lot of experience and transitions represented. And I thank you all for helping me out here tonight. Uh, so, Georgie, you essentially went from higher ed to consulting to back to higher ed. Discuss the pros and cons of going from Dottie to you to consulting. Where are the trade-offs? So, I think that the pros of working in higher ed are you definitely have a lot of job security. And you know, that can go both ways. And, like, if you're doing a great job and you have security in that, then that's great. Sometimes we might come across people who have the job security and you know, you're like, why do you have this job security? Um, uh, the, but the biggest pro, I think, of working in higher ed is, is the community. And I think that that um, is partially the people that you work with immediately on your team uh, and then sort of the broader network of people and staff. And also just feeling a part of the campus community, the students, the alumni, the faculty, the staff, other staff on campus. And there's a real sense of community on, on, a, on a university campus. Mm -hmm. um, I think that working as part of a team, obviously there's a lot of you know solo people out there, as, the, as uh, Tanya and Ron Bronson would, would definitely assert on, on hired solo live. Um, but you know, even finding people across the institution with whom to collaborate can be really powerful. Uh, the biggest thing for me has always been having a sense of being tethered to a mission. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Is that a Cat? lion? That was a lion. That was a lion. Um, uh, being set, tethered to a mission um, and really, you know, we talk about a mission-driven institution and sort of use that as like almost like a buzzword, but to me it really is a driver to really feel that I'm, you know, it's one of the reasons I left journalism. I love working in the newsroom, but, you know, it was just working for a bottom line. That wasn't enough for me. I needed to feel like I was doing something that mattered, that mattered to people, that mattered to students, that mattered to the community at large. So really having a sense of purpose driving my work instead of just, you know, did we make money this month or whatever. Um, it's really motivating for me. Um, also, one reason to go to higher ed instead of consulting is to get out of the house. Uh, I spent a lot of time talking to those cats uh, when I was consulting. <laughs> uh, they were my silent business partners. Um, some of the cons, I think, uh, of going back to, to EDU, you have to have a lack of flexibility. Uh, it, that's your, your own personal lifestyle and also in the way that you work. Uh, there's a certain you know, trade offs that you have to make in terms of your work style. Um, also, I mean, you know, when I was consulting, I could pick and choose my work. If someone said, hey, do you want to do this project? If I didn't want to do it, and if I could afford not to do it, I could say no. Uh, but a lot of times in higher ed, you have to do things that you may not really want to do, um, or that, you know, sometimes it's a good thing. It challenges you, it pushes you, you learn something new. But sometimes it's just like, ah, oh, this is, you know, this is, it doesn't really take best advantage of my skills or, or whatnot. Um, one other personal disadvantage was that uh, lack of travel. I love travel. Um, so definitely uh, lifestyle-wise is a trade-off to sort of uh, get off the airplane for a little bit. Um, also, office kitchens just suck. Well, no matter where you work, I don't think it's a high red thing. I think it's just, unless you work at Google or something, your office kitchen is probably going to suck. And you have to like get your, your string cheese stolen out of your refrigerator, and it's just awful. So I would say that's a huge con. <laughs> okay. You heard it here. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> That's our problem with higher ed. The office. string cheese incident. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay, so Matt, talk to us about the progress you made in Florida and how you've dealt with effectively starting over on some levels at the new job. Um, you know, it was really hard both on personal level, professional level, everything picking up and moving. Um, the university I worked for most previously was, you know, the first place that kind of took a chance on me, and it was my opportunity to move into leadership um, for sort of the first time in my career. Um, you know, I was pretty fortunate in that I had a really great team um, there at the end. We had our process down to where we could do everything we needed to do in our sleep. I mean, it was just boom, boom, boom. I could sit and say for sure I would hit every deadline. Um, you know, knew pretty much we had a psychic sense and we would know the issues coming in advance. 
Um, you know, for my new job so far, um, I've made some great hires, so that's awesome. We've had a few small wins, um, so that's been good, and we're starting to kind of gel. Um, but there is just a mountain of work to do, and I'm having to work through a lot of issues, a lot of process, a lot of things that just really aren't in place here right now. So, you know, just working to rein all that in, um, make order to the chaos. It took me, I guess, really, you know, three to four years to do that, and now I'm having to come over and start and do that again, which essentially is why I took the job, but doesn't mean it's an easy thing to accomplish. Definitely. Uh, Drew, you went from central marketing to a single college IT. Give us some insights on transitioning into a very different type of department. Well, that uh, <clears throat> it's been quite a culture shift for me. The, the old job was I worked in a marketing PR kind of communication shop. Um, it was really, it was centered on branding and design and, and telling stories was the central role that the people around me were engaged in. Um, the people I worked with had an interest in the web, but it was more uh, surface level, I would say, towards the web. And we know that the web involves a mixture of IT and marketing. I was trying to think of an analogy to to talk about the level of interest that most marketing folks have with the web. I'm thinking of a 16-year-old girl who is interested in her new Honda Civic, but beyond the color of the car and some of the amenities, she could really care less what's under the hood. And so it was going from that kind of mindset <clears throat> at a traditional marketing kind of mindset, and my new job is in a technology office, right? And so I'm on the low end of the nerd scale in, in my office. I've gone from, I, I, don't, I don't know, it's... Super nerd. The, <laughs> the quote I've heard is, I'm, I'm the nerdiest person in the art shop and the artiest <laughs> person in the tech shop, right? So um, a few weeks in, I could, you know, barely even comprehend 50% of the conversations that were going on, these these technology people. They're doing desktop support, running servers and clusters. They're managing databases and registration systems. They're doing classroom technology, enterprise systems. And so it's been different for me. It's been a culture shift. Um, it's not really even a different climate. It's more like a different planet. So for the past six months, I've been kind of like the guy from Avatar. I've been going down to learning their culture and getting used to that that style of work being a web guy in, in a technology office. So the upside though of my move is that um, I've been able to go from where I was in a campus-wide branding kind of overview position down to a, a smaller sphere of influence within a college of a university. So I can do all things web. I can flex my design, content, and development muscles. Um, basically, I used to uh, kind of look down at the people at the college level and wish they would do their jobs correctly. And now I am one of those people. So I kind of know what I... <laughs> so do your job, yeah. Drew. Yeah, and so now <clears throat> I'm looking at myself and I know what I need to, I need to do because I have that perspective. Um, so that's been great. Uh, plus, I've been able to you know get some close relationships going with the communications director and the other marketing communications people where I'm at. But... Definitely moving from communications to IT is a pretty big culture shift, and if anyone is interested in doing that, they should, they should talk to me, and they should keep certain things in mind if they do that. Because the web is generally split. You see it in an IT shop, or you see it in advancement or marketing. Uh, rarely do you see you know, centralized web shops. But that's been my experience in my move. That's been my experience, too. I don't know of very many schools that have an independent kind of web space. Um, so let's talk about the challenges that you guys are facing in these new roles. Georgie, what's been your biggest challenge so far? I think one of the biggest challenges is just figuring out, you know, part of it is, you know, the cultural adjustment and within that, figuring out how best to affect change. Because anywhere you go, you can bring the same skill sets and, you know, some of the same sort of fundamental principles that, that guide your work, but it's always going to be a, a new canvas that you're painting on. It's going to be a new context. Uh, in which you're trying to do similar kinds of work. So it's figuring out how to affect change. Because as a consultant, 
you kind of you do a drive by really, and you know that's also part of the reason I was wanting to step out of consulting uh, was because I wanted to sort of feel connection to the work beyond sort of oh I got my check peace out you know um, you know because clients can take what you give them and they can take it or leave it and you don't really you can go back and sort of look at the, the site or whatever, be like, oh, did they do what I said? And that's kind of like, you know, like on the outside looking in, like peeking through the window. And, you know, I want to know that the work I did was was valued. Um, and if you're in-house, you can sort of follow up on that a little bit more and sort of be insistent as of doing the, okay, here's some, requ some requirements. Okay, I'm going to go. Um, so, in, so that, you know, but if, if you're consulting, like you move on one way or another. You don't really linger. Um, if you're in house, you can't drive off. You can't do the drive by because you're in it. It's win it, really. So um, I think of it like with the Shawshank Redemption. Uh, like you have Andy Dufresne in his uh, cell with his little rock hammer, sort of chip, chip, chipping away to freedom over the course of like two decades or whatever. Uh, and that's I think that when you're in house, that's sort of what you are. You're sort of Andy Dufresne in that cell, sort of you know we're gonna get there, we're gonna get there, chip, chip, chip. If you're a consultant, you're sort of like. Boom! Like here it is. Like you suck it. Here's why. Okay, I'm gonna go. Uh, and that can be very liberating in a way. Like I can speak truth to power, and everyone's paying me to do that, and that's great. Uh, so that's also an adjustment, is sort of you know realizing that oh, I can't just drop these like you know sledgehammers of truth on people. I have to sort of chip, 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 and be like, okay, I'm gonna wear you down. Uh, but in a sense, but it's also it's you're in house, so you have to build relationships and work together uh, to get those solutions and not be this sort of like solo like sledgehammer wielding vigilante. Um, so you have to be a, an advocate for the kind of changes that you feel need to happen and make the case and, and over time. So it's a slow road, but it's what's one you got to go down. Uh, and Matt, <laughs> sledgehammer of truth. I'm sorry, I'm so <laughs> about right. that. I totally, I totally want one of those. I can just see me wandering around the Mary Washington campus, going, "No, we're doing this the right way." <laughs> exactly. I'm all for. <laughs> uh, okay, so Matt, talk about your challenges. Um, well, it was kind of funny as I was listening to Georgie. It was clicking in my head that maybe that was one of my bigger challenges. Um, I do think it's been hard because I came from being a big influencer where I left and then coming to a place where essentially I had to start over with zero or like negative 20 political capital um, while still feeling as though I should be running at the speed that I was and I've had to kind of readjust um, you know trying to deal with mixed staff trying to um, work through past discussions past decisions um, that sometimes I just kind of look there and I'm like, WTF, what were they thinking? And then trying to put myself in the shoes that they were probably making the best decision for the information or the, what they had at that time, but still saying, WTF, what the hell were they thinking? Um, you know, dealing with just, just CMSs that are all over the place, um, most things not having standards trying to work to an inject process as much as I can along the way. Um, and it, it, it's been a, you know, it's been a definite challenge to just kind of, um, it, it is, I've tried to use, I guess, that, that sledgehammer effect uh, probably to uh, not the best results for the first maybe two to three months I was here. And it's probably only within um, really the last month I finally kind of reflected on that and put myself through a mini panic attack and started saying, I'm going to affect what I can affect, you know, in my realm mm -hmm. um, and starting to kind of work through in the system. I think in the past I could just go in there, make my case, get it done. Um, and it's just, you know, I need to absorb into the culture, not the culture shift towards me. So it's, it's been interesting. I, I absolutely can empathize. I've had a lot of the same experience here. I don't, I don't think I've done the sledgehammer quite so much <laughs> just yet, but um, I've, there's been some some culture issues and some some previous decisions that I've had to kind of take a step back and go, okay, they were coming at this from a completely different perspective and a completely different set of experiences. So we need to adjust, but how do we do that based on what's already there? So I, I totally feel your I feel your pain. Um, Drew, talk about your challenges. Really, it's. Uh... It's similar to Matt's, just getting the lay of the land. Um, for people who have been somewhere, 
a long time. You know, I'd been at my job for six years. You you t you don't think about the circle of working relationships that you've developed where you are and the people that you collaborate with. And when you think about taking a new job, maybe you don't take stock of what you have, where you're at in terms of those relationships. Um, in many ways, I had imagined that I would be prepared to pick up and work in a different place, but you never are really prepared to do that, to step into somewhere where you don't know anybody. All you have is your abilities. You start back at square one and you really just stumble around and make all the mistakes the first few months you're there. Um, and a lot of it's just knowing the history of how of why things are the way they are, where you're at. Um, you don't know many of the players involved. And really, you're just in a state of ignorance. Usually when you start someplace new in my position, there was a lot of work that needed to be done just maintenance-wise. And so um, being strategic is something that needs to be put off until later when you have a firm grip of what you're doing and where you're, you're comfortable with the systems. Um, I'm moving to an institution where they're still using Red Dot, <clears throat> which is, I'm thinking of curse words in my mind right now when I think about Red Dot. We're moving to Omni Update, which is one of your sponsors. Uh, I will say that. So we're, <laughs> we're excited about that. Um, but going back to the ignorant confidence, when you start somewhere new, there's a chart I had found called the four stages of learning, where it talks about um, the the state of being where you, you, you don't even know how much you don't know when you started in a new place. And then you find, actually find out and you're becoming aware of all the things you need to learn. Um, and that's called conscience, conscious incompetence, I think, to where you're aware of your incompetence at your new job. But I think I've gotten to where I've moved beyond that. I'm starting to get my feet. Um, my, it's funny, my, uh, my old boss said, when you take on a new job, just write the first six months off. And at the time, I didn't believe her, but now I'm really taking stock in that because it's only about six months in today where I'm really, I found my feet and I can start moving on, on, big, on big things. Uh, so that's what, the, that's what the shift has been like for me. So, <laughs> yeah, no big deal. So... <laughs> What I'm hearing from all of you is that you're figuring out where you are, where you need to be, and how to get there. So yeah. no big. It's we're all just finding just, ourselves again. No problem. Yeah, just self paralyzing self discovery. No, no <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> so, um, Georgie, we just had a question on Twitter, and I know you already answered it, but if you want to talk for a second about sure. um, the transition to away from working from home and missing people and all of that. Yeah. It. The challenge with working for yourself again. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I never really was alone. I had I had Truman and Locke. Um, but the you know, I, mean, I have my ideas. I think my ideas are, are pretty okay. But an idea always becomes better when you have someone to sort of beat against the wall a little bit and sort of test it and try it and talk through it. So when you're working for yourself, you know, an institution is, is giving you a bucket of money to, you know, to give them a solution to a problem and. I, again, I think my ideas are pretty okay, but they're never going to be as good as when someone tests them and, and, and puts them through the ringer a little bit. It's like, it's like a, an edited piece is always going to be better than just sort of the raw first draft. Um, so it's definitely knowing, you know, I'm like, I think this is the right thing to recommend. Uh, okay, I'm going to write it in the document. Um, and sort of trusting yourself, and it's really scary. Uh, so why those, you know, idea, those opportunities for collaboration, and not just the company. I mean, I had the cats, you know. But the collaboration and really having people to work with, you can go in and just be like, what do you think of this? Like, I have this idea. Like, I don't know. Like, what do you think? Uh, and also people outside your own discipline. Like, one of the things I missed the most was going into our developers' offices um, and just being like, tell me, like, you know, I, I want the thing to do this and serve content from here. Like, can we do that? And then learning all about, like, databases and servers and be like, hmm. But I learned, you know. Uh, and, you know, I can Google things, but it's not really quite the same as, as talk, going to someone's office and talking to them and having that learning opportunity. So, um, you know, going back into an institution, like, you have that opportunity to, to go over to the graphic designer's office or go to the, the you know, go to the programmer's office and, and ask those questions. And, uh, or just go to your colleagues and be like, you know, what do you think of this? And having people sort of say, well, maybe this, or how about this, or that's great, or whatever. So... 
Um, and that's definitely a huge advantage to being back uh, in the office. So tell me about pleasant surprises. What did you guys not anticipate loving about your new job? Matt? Um, you know, I, I think it's been interesting. You know, the people that I've, I, I've hired so far have been really great. Um, and I've been really happy with that because I, you know, obviously was the first one on my team starting from scratch again. Um, and you really have some anticipation when you have a staff of zero and already have a 40 project queue when you start day one. Um, and I've had people who have just jumped in day one, you know, essentially sprinting like I was. Um, and, you know, with the staff that we've had already on BARD, um, I think that there's, you know, the commitment to getting things right. I think it's a really long road. Um, but we, whether it's the money, the people, the whatever um, that we're working on getting, I think everybody is committed to doing it right. Um, and that I, I would say that that, I've never been aligned with a place that's been that driven to kind of hit the brand out of the park and do it right, as opposed to just having it be something that sort of comes together. Um, so it's been pretty great. All right, Georgie, what about you? Um, I think one thing that's been really great is that there's a lot of really smart people, both in my department and also just around the university. So, you know, it may be someone who is not doing something, you know, it's a best practice, whatever, but if you go and sit down with them, it's like, you know, they're, they're, they want to learn, they want to do the right thing, and you have these great conversations, you learn about where they're coming from, um, and, you know, they ask smart questions, they want to do good work, and it's really great. Um, there's also a really wide variety of projects, which I really like. Uh, there's a lot of challenges, but a, a real diversity of challenges, and to me that's really rewarding because I, I like to sort of mix it up and I'm definitely never bored. So I think that the combination of uh, sort of a mix of, of interesting uh, work to do uh, and a lot of smart people with whom to do it has, has been really refreshing and that's, you know, definitely uh, made the transition a bit easier. Yeah, I can, I can totally concur with that. That's been my experience here as well. Drew, what about you? Um, Really, it's been about the new people I've been able to work with. Uh, going to a technology shop from a marketing shop, again, has been quite a change, but the amount of things there, is, there are for me to learn about systems and databases and all of the technology side of things that I wasn't exposed to before, or just kind of on the outside looking in, um, I'm really going to be able to expand and become a better web person just for having this kind of exposure. And really, I like, I like the chance to have a clean slate to start over, to apply the lessons of the dumb things I did in my previous job and know to not do them at this new slate, like confess ignorance about certain skills that I didn't, you know, I didn't want to end up spending all my time in my last job helping people with their PowerPoint presentations or showing them how to use the printer. Um, but all the people I'm around now, I mean, that's that's not an issue for them. They're they're IT people, so it's just, it's totally different. Um, I like working with a new color. I was looking at the same hex value for six years at my previous job, right? And so now I've moved from maroon to red, which is not a big difference, you would think, but it it's, it makes uh, the transition to the new job easier, doesn't it? It's not too jarring. Oh my god! If it was gold, yeah. you'd be going insane. I literally just about had that hex color tattooed on my arm at the, at the other place. I can still recite it. Um, I get a chance to learn new acronyms, right, because that's what we do at universities. And really, it's helped me to lighten up. There were things that I was really, really passionate about, maybe even overly passionate at my last job. The, the design and development babies that we kind of birthed and developed and coddled um, from this new place, I care That's very visual. little Thank you. about those things, <laughs> you know? I, I, yeah, it's... <laughs> I'm thinking, of, yeah. But from a distance, those things that mattered so much, those projects that we argued and fought over and coddled, um, what really matters now is, looking back, is the people I worked with, the experiences we had and the lessons I learned. Right? So um, moving from a job has given you perspective 
on what really matters in your new job, I think, plus the new people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my new boss is great, and so uh, there's, lots of, there's, there's lots of great things about my new job, most of which I don't even know about yet. Why are you laughing at me? I'm not <laughs> laughing at you. I'm laughing at Matt. I'm sorry. I should shut down the chat. Um, so, <clears throat> bringing it back I together. Uh, so when I, when <laughs> I wish I wish the audience could see the chat. That would be good. <laughs> uh, all right. When I wrote this next question, I labeled it SSDD. So you know, same stuff, different day. What can you identify as being a common theme or issues throughout your hired experience, Georgie? Uh, so people say they want strategy, but they really don't. <laughs> um, people say they're strategic. They say they want to be strategic. They have strategy. This is their strategy. This word starts losing meaning. People say it so much, but and I, I think this is I think this would honestly be true at most higher ed institutions, um, and it's a challenge to sort of try to to, to move the needle otherwise. Um, people really love the idea of strategy, but strategy takes a lot of work to make something that you um, execute on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so we can sit down in a boardroom for a, a, a day or a couple of days and come up with this awesome strategy, but at the end of the day, how do you implement it? Like, how do you make it something that everyone up and down the organization, uh, it's baked into the work that they do, like the, the mundane work even, something that strategy is tied to that. Like, that takes a lot of, of work. It takes time. Uh, we don't always want to do the work or have the time to do it. And so I think it's a huge challenge to make strategy actionable. Um, when I was a consultant, I worked with one client who will remain unnamed, um, but I kind of want to shout their name because they were actually awesome because I sat down with the VP and she's like, here's our strategic communications plan. And I was like, you know, I'll go do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she's like, here it is. And I read it and I, I had a single tear. It was... <laughs> it, it, it was... It was so beautiful. I I was like, can I marry this? Like, this is awesome. Uh, and it was really thoughtful. And it was it talked about their shortcomings and areas where they wanted to improve and aligned it with the university's broader strategic plan. Uh, and it was just really, really great. And you know, they were sort of at the beginning stages, who sort of still working on it, needing to roll it out and everything. But you know, it was just so awesome. And I think there's there's one listserv. Uh, that a lot of us maybe belong to in higher ed where, you know, that question will come up for you and it's like, has anyone worked with a strategic communications plan? And everyone says, I would love to see one too. And it's like this, <laughs> this like mythical, like, unicorn of higher ed, the strategic communications plan. It's like, do you have one? I don't know. Do you have one? Because it's really hard to, even if you drafted one, like, it would be really hard to put into practice. So I think that the universal truth would be that, you know, people want it, people love the idea of it, but really making it Putting it into practice is something that, that informs the day to day. Uh, making our day to day work strategic at some level is is really hard to do, and I think that it, it doesn't get done often enough. Amen. And also, do you have a copy of that strategic communications <laughs> plan? Because I really, I, I do. <laughs> I, I do actually. <laughs> I've never it's seen a, this. Bad libs. Yeah. <laughs> At Blank uh, University, our mission is blank. Exactly. Yeah, I could I could totally use some of that. Yeah. Uh, okay, Matt, what about you? Well, I'll just throw into that. I'm about ankle deep in uh, strategy planning right now for our marketing. It's actually what I've been doing for like the last three months, pretty much every single day. So I can't even barely focus on the website by itself. Um, so totally, totally agree with what Georgie said. I think some of the other pieces, though, that I keep seeing all the time is figuring out what the mission of a web team is. It's such this uh, weird hybrid. It's dictated by what division you're in. It's both marketer and technologist and having to straddle those pieces. And, you know, uh, Drew pretty much hit it on the head because he talked about going from one to the other and, you know, it's getting the right mix of staff to be able to deliver on the challenges, uh, you know, that are put in front of you. Um, I think, you know, a lot of organization, you know, is now on the web, but, you know, how that gets reflected and how staffing around that is, um, you know, I, I don't know that it really aligns with that. And I was having a discussion with our, um, our director of marketing here, and he came from a more of like an online focused university and they have like three web teams. They have, you know, 
an internal communications team or internal web team. They have a marketing web team. They have, you know, the systems type web team. Um, and I can probably add another two or three to that. But I just feel like sometimes, you know, the web team is pulled in so many directions because they have to do all the things that, you know, in most cases would probably be sectioned into different pieces. So there's like a PR team and there's a news team and there's the marketing team. On web, you're all those things. And you're also the technology team. And just I think that it's getting to this point where um, web teams are getting spread really thin. Uh, and the challenges in front of them, it used to be just you're the people on the website, do your thing and make it happen. But now I'm being just as challenged and just as ingrained in our marketing and branding plans than our director of marketing is. I'm just trying to bring you know, what I know to it, but I'm applying it to the web just as much as they are in any of the other mediums. Um, and it, it seems to hold true pretty much everywhere. Identity crisis, I guess. Yeah, it, we're being spread thin. I just tweeted preach it because I think that's completely <laughs> true. <laughs> spread thin might be a little, taking it a little nice. Um, all right, so Drew, what about you? Um, I agree with everything everybody said. Uh, I would add to that, um, really, the issues with the web are going to be the same anywhere you go in corporate or in higher ed. Uh, there's the whole IT versus marketing thing. There's the question of where the web lives. Um, a big one to me is people generally want to talk about design frills and packaging over the actual substance of their site and the stories they're telling. And they might think that this new tool they're going to get is going to solve everything. And somehow their CMS is going to do their content strategy for them. Uh, these things have all already been brought up. But uh, those things are universal. And it doesn't matter which side of it you're on. If you have anything to do with the web, you're going to run into those problems and those issues everywhere you go. So the challenges are the same. We have a thousand objectives, things we can do, things we're asked to do. The struggle is just learning to be, instead of being reactionary, to being strategic and focusing on core things and learning how to manage your time. And that's something that we can all get better at. Um, and those are, those are the same things I saw at my last job, and I see them here, too. More deep thoughts from deep College thoughts. Web Guy. <laughs> I, I keep sounding negative, but one of my, I guess my, the way I, I see things as a designer is I, I find problems and I fixate on them. Um, really underneath, I'm much more positive once you get to know me. Right? <laughs> But good to know. I, the undesirable things come into focus for me so much easier than the positives. But uh, emo right. drew. Emo yeah, drew. Right, right. Well, and I think that's that's true for all you know all of us. We it's our job to find the the issues and fix them. So it's easier for us to do that than to fixate on the positive things because we don't need to work on those because they're already okay. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to just quick say thanks to all three of you. I've got one last question for each of you, and then if anybody has any questions they want to tweet, um, we'll answer those and then we'll be done. So, Georgie, you went from newsroom to .edu to consulting and then back to .edu. <laughs> That's a lot of culture differences wrapped up. So <laughs> yeah. what, what has been the most profound culture shock you've experienced in those transitions? I, I remember very clearly when I first started at Tufts, um, I was working in the second oldest building on campus on the quad on top of the hill, and there's, you know, people playing frisbee just outside my window and everything. I remember thinking one day, it's so quiet in here, because I'm used to working in a newsroom where we have radio and TV and reporters and phones ringing and, and, and everything happening all at once and sort of being able to like, manage all these distractions while still, like, reporting breaking news, like, you know, there are often some days of my job where I, I would come in and I wouldn't get up to use the bathroom like the whole time uh, because <laughs> gross, right? But, but because there, you know, I was on a desk when the shell of Columbia exploded. I was there when the station nightclub fire killed 100 people in Rhode Island. I was working when the war in Afghanistan began. I was working when the Patriots won the first Super Bowl. Like, like really intense stuff. And then you come to higher ed, and you know, sometimes you, just, you know, when I first started, it's like I almost felt bored. To work at this like, breakneck speed all the time, and suddenly it's like suddenly this puts on brakes. 
Um, and of course, as I sort of got deeper in my role and, and got to know more things, you know, my, my you know, job sort of fleshed itself out. I wasn't like sitting around bored anymore, but uh, it definitely wasn't a newsroom. But what was really great is that the, the few times in hiring where there has been some sort of a crisis or some sort of, you know, opportunity where you had to go, 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 uh, I could always pull on my newsroom background and just just go crazy and just like, do a lot of work in a short amount of time and, 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 and sort of, you know, I kind of like when those little crisis things happen. Not that you like a crisis, but if it's like, quick, do a story on whatever, we just got this gift or those kinds of things, you got to pull together a bunch of content really quickly or something like that. I kind of like when those things come up because I can like flip on newsroom mode and just go in the zone and make it happen. So it's kind of a, a good throwback. Um, you know, there was less culture shock, I think, tra transitioning from, from higher ed to consulting, because um, I, you know, I kind of project managed my life within an inch of itself already, so it wasn't like I was like, I have all this unstructured time, I have all these problems now because I'm working from home or whatever. I was able to sort of manage things pretty well. Uh, the culture shock, like I mentioned earlier, was travel, definitely. Um, I did the math, and I realized that the year I was consulting, I spent 20% of my time was out of town. A fifth of my life was spent on the road. Um, so that was kind of, you know, I, I loved it. I loved being on the road that much, but definitely coming back into higher ed and not being, say, a fifth of my life uh, on, an air, on an airplane was, that was a culture shock as well. So when you, I read that, and I did the math real quick, and that came out to two and a half months of travel. You were on the road for two and a half months last year. Yeah. That's a whole lot of airline peanuts. Sometimes they give you pretzels, just saying. Oh. Shaking things up a bit. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> uh, so, Matt, you moved halfway across the country for your, new, for your new position. Let's talk about life off campus and what's the location change meant to you. Um, well, this is actually the third time I've moved across the country for jobs. I started in Iowa, moved to Texas, moved from Texas to Florida, moved from Florida to Omaha. So, essentially, I've done a circle through the southern part of the United States, I guess, in my years. Um, the most recent move has been a little rough. I have a lot of from work and life stress right now. Um, you know, I, outside of work, I had really great friends um, in Miami. I had a comfortable lifestyle, you know, you had it's the Miami. Ocean, right? Yes, I had the ocean. <laughs> the best thing I have here is like a lake or a puddle, depending on how much it rains. Um, <laughs> You know, work has been really all-consuming since I moved, um, and I have my first kid on the way in September. Um, so, unfortunately, my work-life balance has been out of whack, and it's been overly focused on work when really it probably should be focused on life. Um, and, you know, I, I really had things on cruise control before I moved, um, and, you know, I, I haven't found that perfect focus yet. So... Um, it sounds almost like I'm emo Drew, but uh, <laughs> I am happy. I'm just needing to work through and, uh, you know, work through some things, and it's a little rough right now, to be honest, but um, <laughs> I took the job because I'm up to a challenge, and I'm going to meet the challenge, so it's great. We'll do therapy sessions over beer later. Yes, October. a lot of them. <laughs> Scotch, that's my uh, thing. Single right. tier. <laughs> Single tier. Um, so... <laughs> Drew, you picked your family up and moved ac moved across the state to work at the flagship campus within the same system. So, did the fact that you moved within the system bring along with it any baggage or positives? It it really didn't. It just it brought into focus some ironies that uh, back at at my other employer, I was real close with recruitment efforts, and we always disliked how the flagship university would come in and act like they were the end all be all and they were the best at everything. We really felt like we were competing with them. Um, and then I get to the flagship university, and most of these people don't even realize the smaller schools exist. They're busy competing with other flagship universities. right? And it's funny to me. There's nothing like competing with somebody who doesn't view you as an adversary. It kind of has ties to sports rivals, too. But the upside of moving within the same state system is that all my benefits and vacation time... 401k just moved with me, uh, so I didn't have to redo all of that stuff. Um, and the upside, I don't have to pretend to be a UALR sports fan. I was always kind of a Razorback at heart, 
Um, Go so Trojans! <laughs> right, right. But it's been a great move for me. Uh, stressful. It's always stressful moving new job, taking on a new job. But uh, definitely the upside has been there for me in this move. All right. Well, we've got a couple of um, tweeted questions. So, um, and I'll just throw these out there, and anybody can answer that wants to. Uh, Moonball says, "Are you happier in your new positions? Are you glad that you made the change? Do you have any regrets?" Does anybody First, want to take that? I'll jump in. Okay. Yes, I am very happy. Uh, a big part of why I took this job is I kind of needed, I was in a transitional phase of my life and I needed to have a place that aligned more with my personal desires in life. Uh, I did really well at my job in Miami, but it was not a good personal life fit. So I'm sacrificing, I would say, some short-term stress for long-term reward. Um, and then with the bigger picture of the job, I think the job is going to be so much more rewarding because um, it, it's a place where, you know, I'm able to facilitate great change. There's actual money, unlike working for a public institution, to do and accomplish the things that you need to do, which is uh, mind-blowing. Uh, never had budget. that before. What's, that? What's a budget? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, really, I never really have had much to speak of when it comes to a budget, and so I'm able to do and influence more. And please, if any vendors are listening, do not email me. Um, <laughs> he has the budget. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think it's an opportunity to kind of do what I've needed to do for the first time in my life. Uh, so it's great. All right. Does anybody else want to tackle that one? Not touching it? <laughs> Anybody? I just like I like being somewhere where I have more resources and a clearer mandate um, and a more defined sphere to work in. Mm -hmm. That is a huge deal to me, knowing that I have more freedom and the ability to go, you know, do whatever I need to do to get the job done. You know, and all, obviously more money is an issue too. Uh, those things are a big deal because with the web, you're all about getting things done. Right. Uh, it's Resources are definitely nice. Having, you know, there's definitely some uh, staffing that we have that, you know, has had not been had in place in previous roles. So it's good to sort of have a more sort of well-rounded uh, team that is in-house to, to tackle problems with. So that's that's handy. I don't have a team. I have Curtis, but he does all the work anyway, so it works out. <laughs> Curtis is is provides the depth of a team on his own. He okay. does. Let's you guys. Um, okay, so are you ha uh, the question, next question is, what cultural attribute do you wish you could have brought from your old job to your new one? Well, should I answer that from the consulting perspective or the previous institution perspective? Whatever you want, honey. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. Someone else can answer while I think about it then. Okay. Anyone? Go for it, Drew. I'm still thinking. <laughs> <laughs> cultural perspective that I wish cultural I could have brought. Attribute. attribute. Uh, actually, I have an answer. Oh, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I just miss some of the people I worked with and their their cultural perspective, their attitude. You know, you, you get close to people you work closely with in the same office, and they're not there to jaw at anymore. Uh, I don't think that's a direct answer to that question, though. Uh, for me, one of the things that's been a really interesting transition I always used to go to conferences and wonder why when people introduce themselves, they would say, like, my name's whatever, I work in a small private or whatever. I would always wonder why people said that. And the cultural shift from I've always worked at huge public institutions to working at a, I call it small, they call it medium-sized Jesuit Catholic university. Um, part of the Jesuit tradition is you're humble. <laughs> and it's hard working uh, in a marketing department for a place that tries to be humble because they don't want to brag. They don't want to tell their story, and it's, it's honestly extremely challenging. But so, you, can, you can brag about being humble, right? You can say we're the most humble. <laughs> no, they just don't want to say anything. So um, I guess just the ability to, to tell your story and be proud they have an amazing story. They just uh, are sometimes too humble to tell it. And I guess it's a good problem to have, uh, that you have an amazing story and tradition. 
Uh, our challenge is just getting people comfortable with telling it. I wish I could bring my cats to my new job. <laughs> but I can't. That's okay. Is that is that your answer, Jordy? That, that's my answer. That's, your that's answer. all I got. <laughs> Truman and Final Locke. answer. Yeah. Final answer. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys. I think we've just about hit time. Um, and thanks so much to the Hired Live crew for letting me host tonight's show. Uh, thanks to Georgie and Matt and Drew for giving us their time and insights. Uh, join us next Thursday on Hired Live when um, oh Carrie Phillips and Brent Passmore give us a High Ed Web Arkansas recap. So that's going to be awesome. And um, thanks. Bye. Bye. Tear. Single tear. Bye.